Hello, and welcome to this webinar hosted by World Cement. I realize that many of you will be working from home or self-isolating today, so thank you for taking the time to join us here. Our presenters today are Unity Kingi and Roberto Linares of Petuim. Their presentation will explain how unlocking the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning is projected to drive the next generation of industrial manufacturing. They will cover the following, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning applications for cement manufacturing, including AI-based soft sensors, asset and process optimization, and visual inspection with computer vision. Additionally, they will also provide a real-world case study and discuss the results. As always, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so feel free to type your questions in the question box on the right of your screen as we go along, and we will address these at the end. Um, everyone who registered to attend today's webinar will be emailed a full recording of this session. And now, over to Unity and Roberto for their presentation. Thank you, David. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It's our pleasure to be here with you all today, and we are very excited. Um, so today, as David mentioned, we are going to talk about uh, transforming data into actionable intelligence. Uh, let me quickly introduce myself. Uh, I'm Unati Kingi. I am head of uh, customer solutions at Petum, responsible for product management as well as customer success. And uh, I have my colleague here with me, Roberto Linares. Roberto, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, my name is Roberto Linares. I am AI Solutions Principal at Petum. I have worked in the cement industry many years. Uh, also, I have been working in optimization and, and implementing uh, Petum Optimum. Thanks, Roberto. So uh, we're going to talk about how we are going to trans uh, how we are helping customers transform data into actionable intelligence. Um, as you all know that you know AI and ML are not created equal. And what I mean by that is there's a clear difference between companies and their performance when they're using simple analytics tools versus the ones that are using predictive and prescriptive insights into their day-to-day decision-making. And we'll talk about some real examples that'll make this even more meaningful. So today's agenda is we'll start with uh, introduction about Petium, who we are, what we do. And we'll specifically go into some applications for cement manufacturing. These also represent um, various AI technologies. And we will go through each one of them in more detail. And finally, we'll summarize this with some case study and results. So before we actually deep dive, I first wanted to set the context around what is artificial intelligence and machine learning. As you might expect, there are so many definitions of artificial intelligence. Um, and what Gartner defines AI is that it applies advanced analysis as well as logic-based techniques to interpret events, support and automate decisions, and to take action. And I really want uh, your focus around two things here. One is uh, support and automate decision and to take action. We at Petum strongly believe that the most you can get out of your data is not just through simple interpretation and predictions, but it's important and we want to take our customers to the next level by actually automating their decision process as well as taking action. And why is this important? This is important because according to a recent study done by McKinsey, AI is predicted to be adding up to $5.8 trillion in value globally. And specifically for industrial segments and manufacturers who are going to be embracing AI are going to see about 15% improvement in their margins compared to their peers. And we want our customers to go to that level. Um, and while this is a great outlook, I also want to say the flip side of this is that AI is not magic. And you cannot expect overnight results. These have to be carefully crafted as well as you know, work towards the results so that you can actually see positive results and ROI. So now let's talk about who Petium is. Um, Petium is a startup which was founded four years back uh, out of Carnegie Mellon University, which is considered to be one of the top universities for AI research across the globe. 
um, we have about 50 plus AI experts coming in from top universities. And our goal, uh, our vision is to provide simple, streamlined, and cost-effective AI solutions for many verticals uh, and many enterprises. We recently also received the Cement Project of the Year Award last year uh, with CIMEX. So now let's talk about how do you actually, you know, bring AI to production, right? When you want to take a concept uh, of AI that to production, there are lots of steps as well as lots of uh, elements and stages that you have to go through. And customers who actually want to truly reap the benefits of AI have many obstacles that they have to face. Uh, the first one is around ideas to production, meaning when the customers actually think of uh, one of the ideas, the first thing that they have to start with is obviously many types of data sources. The volume of data is high. And when you really want to bring all of those together, it is a challenge. Um, once you actually bring all of that data together, the next um, issue is around AI talent. We all know that there is a, a you know, dearth of AI talent across globe. And uh, every business problem that you want to solve actually has a unique AI skill set that is needed, whether it is computer vision, natural language processing, or time series, right? Every business problem will have a unique uh, set of technologies that need to be used. And then finally, AI is affordable only when you are able to actually repeat it, reuse it, and you have a strong foundational infrastructure that is able to let you do that repeatability. Um, whether it is from an asset to asset, site to site, it becomes more meaningful when you are able to scale. So we at Petium help our customers, you know, tackle these obstacles uh, that we just talked about. And uh, what we do is we have a backend which actually supports all, all, all of our data pipelines, um, as well as uh, model development, uh, as well as training, serving, and help integrate that with customers' ecosystem. And this actually helps us repeat uh, and reuse our components very easily. The second is around AI talent, which is uh, again, as I was talking about, there is uh, definitely a scarcity of AI talent across the globe. And to help with that, we have some pre-built modules, uh, which we call as AI accelerators, which can be applied to a customer's or a business's uh, unique need. For example, things like image defect detection or data labeling. These are all core components that can be applied to your business needs and are pre-built and available. Again, the other one that we have is around industry solutions. And these are end-to-end -end solutions that we have across different industry verticals that are solving unique needs for that particular industry vertical. So based on where you are at with your digital transformation journey, we have all of the core components that can help you get started as well as realize the potential of AI. Now, next we are going to talk about specifically the cement uh, manufacturing applications that we have. And we will talk about the mix of AI technologies and how these will add value to you. So looking into the entire cement and concrete uh, value chain. It starts all the way from planning, uh, which is whether you're planning for demand or for resources, procuring uh, the raw material, for example, making cement uh, or clinker, and then finally delivering and managing. So this is the entire uh, value chain. And within that value chain, there are lots of opp opportunities and use cases where AI can be applied. And Petum is looking into many of these use cases where we can provide value. But today, uh, we are specifically going to be focusing on the make portion, 
which is the core operation of cement manufacturing. And we'll deep dive into three offerings uh, in more detail. The first one is soft sensors, and I'll talk more about that, which is a prediction uh, offering. The second is asset and process optimization, which takes prediction, prescription, and actually automation uh, to assets and processes. And then finally, we will talk about how do we leverage computer vision technologies uh, for asset monitoring as well as anomaly detection. So let's now deep dive into the first one, uh, the first offering, which is uh, soft sensors and AI-based soft sensors. So sensors, as you all know, would are devices that are actually measuring uh, physical properties. Physical properties meaning being like temperature, pressure, etc. And soft sensors are sensor which are database or virtual. And these are really useful when your traditional sensor measurement for physical property doesn't work. Um, and when you cannot measure something using traditional sensors, this has to be manual. And it's very cumbersome as well as expensive to measure something. Here, AI-based uh, soft sensors are extremely useful because you are able to bring in many process variables and input as inputs to very accurately predict a certain parameter. Uh, in this case, would be a soft sensor. So some of the application for cement um, manufacturing side would be any kind of lab test result whether it is the kiln-free lime or cement fineness coming out of ball mill. These are great examples where AI-based soft sensors can provide tremendous value. Now, what are the advantages, right, of uh, AI-based soft sensors? First thing is, as I said, you know, we, can, we are able to bring in many different data sources uh, in together. They, are, they could be, uh, you know, structured, unstructured, which are a, where we are able to identify hidden patterns and trends and able to predict with more accuracy and more reliability that will help get you more information about a, a soft sensor in a more frequent manner. These frequent lab results are, uh, uh, soft sensor results are extremely useful because not just it provides you directional understanding of how the asset or process is going to behave, but also, as I was saying, we focus around uh, decision making and taking action, having timely understanding of more frequent information helps in further optimizing um, your process. For example, the traditional soft sensor, uh, traditional measurement, say for example, a ball mill fineness uh, is done every one to two hours in a cement manufacturing uh, facility. While a soft sensor can actually provide you a prediction every 30 minutes, which is reliable and, and, and accurate, and based on that, you are able to further optimize your ball mill's performance and adjust the separator speed so that you get even more throughput and yield. Now let's talk about the next um, offering that we have. Uh, this is Petium Optimum uh, for asset and process optimization. And so Petium Optimum is our product where we are able to, on a real-time basis, um, on, on the real-time basis, able to control as well as optimize the assets and processes. This is extremely useful because this uh, can be done even with changing operating conditions, as well as what the typical comfort zone of the operators would be, and also can go beyond the uh, current expert systems as well as control systems and provide you and maximize the yield as well as stability as well as the energy recovery. And how we do this is based on two-step process. One is we are leveraging the data to create prediction models where uh, the prediction model helps us understand how these assets are going to behave in the next few minutes. These are based on deep learning technologies. And once you understand how these predictions 
uh, are going to happen for the core variables in the next few minutes, that becomes the basis for optimization. And then optimization is done uh, where we are able to look at the search space and identify the best fit prescription that can then be applied to the process or the asset to even further optimize it. Uh, some of the applications for cement are uh, cooler, pyroprocess, uh, ball mill, vertical mill, and also maximizing the alternate fuels. And the advantages are obviously bringing in multiple data sources and able to dynamically configure them. We are able to configure them for your specific asset needs and the goals. And then the best part of this is that it's able to self-learn over a period of time, as well as the scenarios that it encounters over a period of time, like the edge cases, we are able to even go beyond and improve those because as the data set gets increased over a period of time, these models' performance keeps on improving. Roberto, do you want to add anything um, here uh, based on your domain uh, knowledge? Yes, uh, I will say that uh, Petrum Optimum can be applied to any of the, the assets of the cement plant that require um, optimization in real time, real time optimization. For example, here in, in this case, we are seeing a cooler controlling in real time. Um, this, uh, this specific example, as, as we know, uh, we have multiple degree, degrees of freedom. So for the operator, it's really hard to optimize it all the time. So by doing subtle changes every minute or every five minutes, we are able to recover more energy, have more stability uh, on, in the undergrade pressure. And also we know that we, we are cooling down the clinker to the required temperature. Great, thank you. Um, so here are some of the implementation phases for um, Petium Optimum. Uh, we we, when we start the process, we work very closely with the customers, uh, subject matter experts, as well as, this, as well as their business leaders to understand what are their goals for that asset or process, whether they want to actually maximize yield or stabilize their operation, or both, right? And so once we have that understanding, we are able to configure our product to their specific needs. And then we start the process of actually collecting and bringing in uh, different data sources together. Uh, and the first step is around identifying uh, correlations between these key process variables. These correlation are very insightful as we provide some of those uh, results and reports to customers. They really appreciate the, uh, the way uh, AI and ML works because they are able to understand some of these correlations that they didn't have visibility before. The next one is around predictions, uh, where, as I said, our prediction models are able to, uh, you know, look at uh, dynamic as well as uh, nonlinear patterns and trends and able to predict more accurately on how the asset or process is going to behave in the next few minutes. And then prescriptions are where we are able to use our predictions as the basis to then further optimize it. Once we go through the process of correlation, prediction, and prescription, are able to uh, you know, provide those on a live stream of data, we validate those with our customers to make sure that um, you know, they, they are directionally accurate, as well as they feel comfortable that these are actually going to add them even more value than what they are seeing today. And once that step is established, we go to the next phase, which is actually taking it on the asset, where we are doing a closed loop of these prescriptions on the asset to drive the asset autonomously in a supervised tier mode. Um, and this is a validation process that we go through uh, with the customers where over over a period over a period of few weeks they are able to start seeing the value and actually start realizing the value with optimum Roberto do you want to talk about and give an example of how the configuration is done for petium optimum 
platform optimum uh, can be uh, configured to optimize the kiln, right? Which is the heart of the cement plant. Or we can uh, also optimize the cooler as a standalone or together with the kiln module, uh, which, uh, you know, together we call it up the pyro, pyro process optimization. And the other essential elements, uh, such as ball mills, um, in the raw mill side and cement side. So all of these modules um, have a standard list of variables. Um, they, uh, this, this list of variables include all of the constraints, all of the variables to be optimized and goals. Uh, in the case of the, the kiln, we know that the system might have different number of stages, four or five, a calciner or a dual calciner. Um, but we can uh, we can configure any of these uh, items in the in the process uh, in order to uh, to be realistic when we develop the dynamic model of, of this system and we adapt to the existing instrumentation and we respect the regulatory controls. So that's that's really really valuable because you know you don't need to change your hardware you don't need to change your instruments to make AI work. So in the you know, in the for in addition, uh, you know, for example, for the kiln, you might want to get uh, more throughput because probably we are in an oversold market, or or it could be that we want to run at a lower energy consumption. It could be that we want to optimize energy and reduce the specific energy consumption. This could be a different goal. And also, you might want to increase the uh, use of alternate fuel so that you can consume uh, less. Uh, less, less expensive fuel so that you can reduce cost. So based on those requirements, we will be providing uh, the best prescriptions or in the control world set point for the important key parameters, the feed rate, the exhaust fan speed, the amount of fuel or flow rates that you're passing through the main burner and consigner, right? So that's, that's one of the examples. So in the case of the cooler, as I said, uh, either you run it together with a, a kiln model or uh, as a standalone model. We uh, typically try to uh, optimize and increase the secondary and tertiary air temperatures while keeping the temperature of a clinker low. This is a very interesting example because of the multiple degrees of freedom. And it's really, really hard for the operator, as I said before, to have the clinker uh, cooling in optimum optimization if if you need to do changes so frequently. But uh, Optimum is an excellent assistant, assistant for the operator. In the case of the ball mills, uh, we know that we are not only optimizing the uh, ball mills itself. We need to look at the overall efficiency of the, uh, the ball mill circuit, including the elevator, the separate speed, feeders. So in some instances, uh, the customers ask us to also to control the injection of water to optimize the use of water and 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 control the the temperature. So that that is also possible. And something that we have found out is that through optimum we uh, we can reach the maximum uh, feed uh, you know in the mill without a uh, you know without any cycling because that's the risk of trying to optimize that you might be, you, you might be passing the capacity and that you might uh, have some cycling. In, uh, in uh, you know increasing too much the recirculation in your in your ball mill. Mm -hmm. Great. So let's now uh, show you uh, how does Optimum uh, dashboard look like. So here is an example of a cooler uh, Optimum dashboard that uh, you know we provide to our uh, you know customers, operators, as well as uh, process engineers where they are able to, on a live, real-time basis, monitor the performance of Optimum. And what they get view of the, the uh, Optimum's uh, availability, meaning how, how much time are, we, uh, are the customers actually engaging Optimum. Uh, they are able to get a trend of the core objectives that have been defined for the asset. For example, in the case of cooler, typically customers want to maximize the secondary air temperature. And so this gives a, a real-time trend of how 
in the next few minutes the prediction how optimum predicts the secondary air temperature is going to move and then it also gives you an understanding if optimum is engaged how much benefit would you see in improvement in energy recovery through optimum and these trends are extremely useful just in prediction mode as well and in prescription mode it provides you the value potential uh, for prescriptions in the case of cooler you know we are controlling different fan flow rates and um, here you are actually able to even control or engage and disengage each prescription individually so you can select the fans that you actually want to be controlled through optimum versus the ones that you don't and it gets get gives you a view of how these prescriptions are actually going to be trending in the next few minutes. So the bottom line is really that uh, a dashboard uh, of Optimum helps you understand historically how the performance is happening through it. So now let's uh, switch gears to computer vision application for cement manufacturing. As you can see, uh, you know, we are going, we are shifting from time series uh, data, bringing to that together and leveraging insights from that to now actually using images uh, within the cement manufacturing facilities to, a, to be able to get value out of those. Uh, these images are getting more and more common in the uh, applications. And where these are most useful is where you are able to monitor and understand where the anomalies can happen in your processes and able to detect those early. So let's talk about the applications. Uh, the first is around asset monitoring. So here you're able to uh, you know, look into like burning zone temperature, et cetera, to be able to um, understand uh, where the, the you know, like hot spots might happen. Uh, defect detection, this is where you might be able to look into the refractory brick images and able to identify the defects on those. Quality assurance is, again, another example of where you're able to, um, you know, might look at like clinker size, etc., to be able to ensure that there is, you know, high quality of the product itself. And then finally, acid and process optimization is where you're able to use the kiln burning zone temperatures uh, as well as thermal images to further optimize your acid and process. The advantages are obviously that you are able to bring in high volumes of images together and able to get insights out of those early. And early indicators are always helpful for detecting abnormalities and then once you identify those uh, abnormalities early, you're able to maximize the useful life. For example, refractory breaks, you're able to maximize the li life of that, as well as reduce the downtime by identifying these defects ahead of time. Um, in the next slide, uh, Roberto, can you give us some specific examples? Yes, um, uh, yes, Renati. So uh, AI basically is giving us the opportunity to use technologies, right, such as computer vision to perform process and asset monitoring. And this is really opening a new dimension for process monitoring, right? So in the case of the kiln, uh, we can detect, uh, you know, abnormalities in the burning zone, uh, you know, detecting conditions of excessive coating, uh, finding conditions of, uh, do, too much dust, for example. And more importantly, uh, if you give images to different operators, probably they might come back with different diagnosis for the same image. So in this way, we can standardize and we can be less dependent on a single person. Also, um, computer vision can be implemented to detect operational uh, issues uh, in the cooler. For example, uh, we can try to, uh, to de de defect, de detect um, snowman formation uh, early, right? Detection of Red River conditions where, which happen because you have uh, certain uh, flow patterns or segrega segregation of clinker particles. So AI could uh, in turn uh, provide uh, optimum flow patterns that could reduce these Red River conditions. Another uh, example is the automation uh, to estimate the average size, uh, particle size of clinker and its, and its size uh, distribution. And this could be uh, really important information that can, can be passed back to the operator so that they, they can adjust 
the, let's say, the clinker, the flame, the, the conditions of the kiln. And even uh, this could be valuable information uh, for, the, uh, for the operation of the mill, because we know the effect that the different particle size, if you have uh, really small particles clinker, this can be very hard uh, to grind. So in addition, uh, most, uh, most kilns now have cameras, right, to monitor the kiln, kiln shell. And we can use computer vision to transform this data automatically uh, to create reports out of this information based, uh, you know, uh, based on expert uh, uh, expert uh, detection uh, to detect uh, early hotspots, find a, an abnormal temperature profiles, indicating, let's say, faulty flame positions, etc. So the important thing is that we uh, we will be able to transform all of that information into uh, into reports that can be easily uh, reviewed and managed by plant uh, engineers. Mm -hmm. So now we are gonna see uh, in this uh, part of the presentation, uh, some results uh, for the different assets of the cement, the cement plant. Uh, we are gonna be talking uh, about the cooler optimization, uh, the ball mill circuits, and also the potential value for the for the pyro for the pyro process. So here is the example of uh, using Petrum Optimum for the clinker cooler, and these are some uh, uh, real life examples for different coolers. Some of these have been compared uh, versus uh, systems with advanced process controls, and all and others uh, with no APC and just having the basic regulatory controls. Here we are summarizing the increase uh, in um, uh, secondary temperature SAT and TAT, tertiary air temperature, both in uh, absolute temperature and percent. And, and if you see, uh, we are able to, to increase uh, these temperatures. So which means that we can uh, recover more heat and we are also able to you know, burn uh, less fuel, both in the calciner um, and in the in the main burner of the rotary kiln, and also something that is that is important is that we are also reducing the amount of cooling air that we are blowing through the cooler. So this is going to re, uh, be reflecting its value in the uh, electrical and power power consumption by by those fans. But I would say that uh, even something uh, more important is that if you see the graph below. Um, uh, something that uh, you see in typical APC is that uh, you generate a table, a linear table uh, for uh, optimum operation of, of the, the particular cooler. And let's call that that is the normal capacity of your kiln. And, and probably uh, in that case, uh, we, you know, optimum will uh, achieve a little bit more than uh, that temperature. But across the capacity of the kiln from the medium to high and a high capacity, we are always doing better. So this means that the dynamic uh, system of uh, a nonlinear uh, capturing all of the variables and conditions of the kiln makes our uh, AI uh, so model so robust that it can handle all of the different uh, ranges of operation. If we if we think about the COVID uh, situation, probably now uh, many kilns are operating uh, operating in a medium capacity. Right, but it could be that once we are back uh, to normal, uh, to a normal market, we're going to be again in high. So the important thing is that you have a single model that is optimum across the the range, of, uh, the whole range of operation. Mm -hmm. In the case of the pyro process, uh, where we see more value uh, when we're working with customers, is the increase uh, of uh, a raw meal that is. Uh, fed to the to the to the kiln in order to produce more more clinker and in turn more cement. Um, so here uh, we uh, uh, you know these are some of the uh, expected results that we're seeing one to four percent, which uh, might uh, depending uh, if we are uh, in, let's say in a oversold situation, it can uh, drastically in, in, increase the revenue for the cement plant uh, for sure. Uh, specific heat consumption reduction. In the power process, is always welcome because of the energy uh, energy savings, and as well as as an optional item, 
We can also uh, provide suggestions or prescriptions in real time for the use of alternate fuels, which are much uh, less expensive. But of course, we need to uh, keep in mind the constraints or your, let's say, exhaust fans and the stability of your kiln so that you cannot simply add it with no limit. So, and here also we summarize that, you know, being cooler part of the pyro process, uh, the estimated value of increasing secondary and tertiary air temperature. And one more important thing is that uh, we are also seeing, uh, even though that sometimes it's not an objective per se, is that we, we have a better, uh, uh, let's say, a standard, a lower standard deviation. For example, in this case, the undergrade pr uh, pressure for the cooler we are seeing uh, you know, a, a dramatic decrease of that. And, and of course, uh, these are the annual uh, opportunity, either as cost savings or revenue in increase, um, depending if you are using pyro uh, together with a, a, a fuel mix uh, optimization. Uh, and these calculations um, were done for a typical modern kiln of uh, 3,000 ton tons per day and a typical 800 kilocal, kilocal per kilogram as a base a reference for the calculations. And then you, you, you can also see the assumptions of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the cost of electricity and fuel, but we have the tools um, that, uh, that can help you to, uh, to perform these estimates uh, you know, for your specific case and capacity of your, of your plant. In the, in the case of the ball mill, uh, you know, the, we have these, these examples, as, as I mentioned before, uh, we, you know, when we are in an oversold, uh, 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 you know, over sold out uh, market situation, we can bring, uh, let's say, we bring four percent more cement, uh, you know, for an existing 100 tons per hour. Uh, you know, we we might be getting a hundred thousand uh, dollars a year more, right, revenue, uh, if um, if we are just attempting to. Uh, reduce power uh, power consumption because we are not in the condition of a sold out market. Uh, we can still have significant uh, savings, and and uh, and because of the extended capacity, uh, we can also uh, estimate that the, uh, the there are cost savings in maintenance. And these are the the metrics that we are seeing. Uh, we are able to increase. Uh, uh, you know, in some uh, some of these cases, four uh, from 2.6 stones per hour to 4.4, uh, which is uh, approximately around three to five six uh, five point six percent. As you know, as you can expect, uh, if you use uh, optimally your ball mill, uh, you pass more material respecting the the blend that you need to produce. Uh, uh, you are going to get uh, more uh, kilowatt, uh, you know, a better re yield or less uh, kilowatt hour per ton reduction uh, for for your ball mill circuit. Great, thank you, Roberto. Um, so, as you heard from Roberto, uh, you know, we have uh, shared some results that have some assumptions in place. Um, but if you want to understand how these specific results would look like for your uh, assets and processes and your unique scenarios, we are more than happy to uh, work with you to help you understand what the ROI would be for your case. Uh, please, pro here is the link uh, for for you to go and uh, you know provide us information if you want to learn more about the Petium's ROI calculator. Uh, again, it's on community.petium.com uh, slash cement underscore ROI underscore calculator. And we uh, recently have also launched uh, a program called as Pathfinder. So if you're ready to operationalize any of your assets and processes, uh, again, you can use the same uh, link here to provide us information about your needs, and we will get in touch with you to get more understanding about that. And beyond uh, the the examples that we talked about uh, and offerings, if there are broader areas within the value chain that we touched upon, uh, and if you are interested to learn more about that as well, you can still use the same link and you know, provide us your contact information and we'll be more than happy to touch base with you. 
So I want to summarize here by talking about, you know, we, we started uh, this journey around ideas to production, AI talent, and AI scale. And we at Petium strongly believe that AI can be transformational if you are able to uh, cross all of these hurdles and able to garner the benefits out of AI. And Petium is here to help you solve that through various levels of solutions that would be applied uh, and can be applicable as you're going through your digital transformation journey. So with that, thank you everyone. And uh, we are here to um, get your questions. Okay, uh, thank you guys for that excellent presentation. Um, as I just said, we're now gonna move on to the Q&A session. Um, we've already had lots of questions come through over the course of the presentation, but if you still have something you'd like to ask, please type it in the box on the right of your screen and we will try and cover as many as possible. Um, though, as I said, we had quite a few, so that any we don't get around to covering uh, will be passed on to the team who'll be able to get back to you in due course. Um, additionally, just a reminder that everyone who registered today uh, will receive a full recording of the presentation via email in the very near future. Um, okay, so first question, I think just a, we'll start off with something not overly technical, but um, with regards to training or retraining um, for operators and staff, when would this need to happen and or would it even need to happen? Is this an important aspect? Yeah, so uh, for training and retraining, what we do at Petium is, you know, we are continuously monitoring the models and its performance over a period of time. So once we identify that there is actually a decay in the performance uh, uh, over a period of time, which is naturally happens with uh, as the assets and processes are running, uh, we trigger an automatic retrain uh, on our backend, which is pretty seamless to the customer. And once that automatic retrain is triggered uh, and the model is retrained, uh, the solution is available for the customer. Uh, you know, with the with the, maybe a brief downtime. Okay, so I, I think this ties into the the, the question I'm about to ask actually from uh, Raul Vigo Rivas, who asks: or, um, Machine learning models uh, performance tends to be quite good when reacting to states similar to the ones the model was trained on. Um, but yeah, what happens when the model faces an unknown, potentially critical state it wasn't trained on? Does it automatically switch to a manual mode, leaving the human operator to take over, or how does it react? Yeah, typically what we said, we, we have some special tags that trigger conditions in which we will, if we identify that, we will recommend the switch off of the auto, the auto steering. Um, for, for example, uh, right now we're not considering, let's say, a startup of the kiln, or something, if if the AI sees some some condition that has not seen, that, and then we can trigger, uh, we just trigger that condition, and the operator operator takes over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would like to add to that is um, we also leverage uh, you know some simulators which help uh, if the model has not learned the key variables and the correlations between some of the key variables. Uh, we also use some of the simulator tra training data as an augmentation uh, if the data is not av available for some of these cases. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have a, another question here from um, Anand Bora who asks, um, can we use artificial intelligence or machine learning to optimize the dosage of ammonia for NOx control in cement plants? Yes, that's, that's for sure. Uh, this uh, this is uh, this can be implemented within the pyro process or as a standalone. Uh, this is uh, uh, you know basically what what we do in that case is that we basically create the correlation uh, and prediction uh, for the conditions of NOx concentrations versus the different feed rates and all of the variables that impact that dosage in order to control it. And, and in that case, what you want to do is just want to get close to the limit of NOx. Uh, without using too much ammonia, it's an optimization problem that we can uh, we can handle with AI for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so Javier Coronado would like to know um, how is Petuum AI implementation different from a conventional online advanced process control or optimization that's based on historical mm -hmm. data analysis? 
Yeah, I, I will say that the, there is a difference. Uh, our customers is, are, are telling us that the capability to predict so far in the future makes us uh, we, you know, more robust in that sense. Now, many of these uh, other systems tend to be uh, more linear in nature. Um, and also they consider just a few uh, input, input points. Uh, when we consider AI, uh, basically we take all of the data available. Uh, we can get hundreds of variables to be used uh, within the model. And uh, basically the experience is that you have, uh, basically AI learns from the operator to operate the best out of all of the conditions. So it's a, it's a, a, a different philosophy, I will say. And when we are comparing these numbers, uh, that, that's where you see the difference. There is a subtle difference between linear and by deprecating, you know, in the other approaches, they deprecate input variables. We, we don't. We use everything. And uh, also to add to that, uh, you know, traditional uh, control systems are good uh, at a certain uh, production capacity level. But where AI really shines is, you know, when you have those variable um, production levels as well, whether you're, you know, whether it's sold out or undersold out, you still are uh, able to see the value with AI because it, uh, you know, adjusts to that fact. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on, uh, with regards to sort of accuracy and success of the operation, how do you, how do you measure these, uh, well, the improvements in performance and accuracy? Yeah, so for each asset, the improvements, uh, you know, obviously are defined uh, uh, based on, you know, what the asset's uh, goals are. For example, for a cooler, the, the goal would be uh, energy recovery. And so what we do is we measure the energy recovery of a customer's baseline system today, as well as uh, the one with uh, Optimum or AI. And uh, that is how we measure the improvements. And some of the results that, um, you know, uh, Roberto just shared a few slides back shows that we are able to see uh, benefit over their existing systems, whether they do have traditional control systems or not. There, there is a benefit that has been seen uh, with AI. Okay. Um, moving on, uh, this is more sort of general question uh, from Pratik Sharma. Um, how is artificial intelligence in these kind of applications different from fuzzy logic control? Well, uh, you know, I have uh, some familiarity uh, with fuzzy logic, and, and basically in fuzzy logic, again, uh, you consider a few, a few, a few inputs and a few outputs. Once you get to a certain number of variables, that's difficult to manage. And there is also some preconceived idea of ranges and things. Uh, in the case of an AI model, uh, we have kind of like a continuous uh, a function, right? That uh, uh, is basically uh, captures all of the dynamics using all of the inputs and outputs, uh, also all of the disturbances. So I would say is uh, basically, you know, Probably we have a, 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 a you know a limit of AI going. We we will be close to fuzzy logic, but we are not taking that approach. We are taking all of the data that the operator sees is what AI uh, gets and does. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Um, another question here. Sorry, these are coming thick and fast. Um, from Pawan Mato, he asks, um, or he says rather, there are different types of coolers, kilns, and equipment from different suppliers. Uh, how do you differentiate for these, and how do you optimize the system to work with these? Well, uh, I would say that at the end of the day, um, AI um, basically, um, or, or our approach of AI, uh, we are considering all of the complexity and all of the variables available. And then we will see that for a specific cooler, we will have less fans, but that's fine. It's just it's just a matter of configuration, what we have seen up to now. Of course, at, at this point, we have been just working with uh, great coolers, right, of different brands, uh, not, not satellite, for example. But uh, in terms of uh, great coolers or kilns, uh, is uh, basically AI is data-driven, and uh, so that, that's the basic difference, right? So, Unati, would you like to add uh, something? 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, we do have uh, defined a standard set of recommendations uh, for every asset uh, because it doesn't matter what the manufacturer of that asset is, really the uh, the core of what we want to do for each asset uh, in terms of objectives are very similar. So for AI, it, it uh, you know, takes into account uh, what those objectives are and what are the constraints within that to be able to keep the asset within those constraints to maximize. So really the manufacturer doesn't really matter. It is the objectives and the, the, the constraints that uh, would matter. Okay, thank you. Um, so another question here, uh, how long does it take to implement a system like this? And um, if I can add a, a second part to that, how long typically um, would you need to wait before seeing uh, results? Yeah, so we actually, for you know, uh, customers that actually want to see the uh, operationalized on their asset, uh, have a Pathfinder program where they are able to start seeing the results in as less as six to eight weeks. Um, there is uh, uh, some time in terms of, you know, that six weeks is around development, uh, uh, training, and validation time that we do. Internally, and then we also work with our customers to validate on site on their asset. Um, so within you know six to eight weeks. Okay, thank you. Um, let's have a look here. So another question: um, Is it possible? Uh, asks Anupam to integrate laboratory results from, for example, XRF or XRD and adjust the control parameters appropriately. Correct. We, we can take any of the uh, lab data um, and uh, we basically, I mean, there are different ways to do it. One way is to integrate directly with the with the lab system. The other, the other one is that probably that lab data is already existing in the process data historian of the plant. And uh, we can take any, uh, any information, uh, let's say, for example, here, uh, you know, so let's say in that you are uh, estimate, let's say, or measuring free lime or whatever variable, we can take that information, um, uh, you know, and then we, you know, this is uh, from the integration side, we can do, uh, and then from as an input variable, we, ca we can take it as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have a question here from uh, Neom Satanapun, who asks, uh, can this artificial intelligence machine learning platform uh, analyze the connected process data in real time and present the result in a kind of state diagram uh, and also pointing out the best optimum state compared to what the current state is. Yes, um, in, in fact, we are doing, uh, many of these things are happening behind the scenes and we are at every point, we are getting the optimum value within many candidates of, uh, let's say, set points. Um, in, and we are working with, uh, with some customers uh, to expose more information of the dynamic of the dynamic systems, and uh, but that is already um, you know um, that that's something that we can uh, we we can expose in some form. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and remember, we still do have time for a few more questions. So if uh, you have some more, please do. Uh, uh, type them in in the box on the right and we'll, we'll try and get through them today um, and if we're not we will uh, pass them on to the team and we'll you'll get an answer in due course um, so on that note um, obviously a system like this requires a, a great deal of data what, what do you do if uh, you don't have enough data or you don't currently have access to the right kind of data I will say this, that um, most companies have data, right? So the, the question is, of course, uh, what is the quality of that data and the amount? Typically, if uh, the customer has a process data historian, uh, what, I, what we have seen is that they have information, right? And, and that is typically enough uh, because sometimes the frequency that this data is probably is not at the best for optimization, but is good, or is good enough for the initial training. Um, many times the DCS has some uh, history, so we can, if, we, if the customer recovers that history from the DCS prior to having, uh, let's say, a historian, that's, that's okay too. But of course, I mean, it, it, this is data driven and we need data and uh, we need to get at least two or three months uh, of operational data. Uh, Unati? 
Yeah, and I would like to add is that, uh, you know, if you don't uh, know whether the quality of the data as well as the quantity of data, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, sufficient or not, you can definitely reach out to us and we will be happy to engage to do a technical assessment to understand whether the volume as well as the quality of data is, um, you know, fit for applying AI or not. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here, a slightly more uh, application-based one from Vadi uh, Venkatesh, who asks, um, is the artificial intelligence uh, only for process operations or can it be applied to logistics and inventory management as well? Yes, uh, AI can be used in, uh, you know, for many applications. In fact, uh, we are already working with uh, companies, uh, even in, this, in, in the concrete side, to optimize the, let's say, concrete uh, distribution. Let's say you have a center where you perform a scheduling, and that basically is really hard for a human being. So uh, we can take all of the data, available inventories, and cost to get the optimal distribution uh, based on the, uh, the different available plants and capacities. Okay, um, well, sort of a follow-up question here from Anupam about the, the, the fuzzy logic situation. Do you have um, any case studies where this system uh, has replaced uh, previously used fuzzy, uh, fuzzy logic solutions? Well, it, it is it's difficult to say, um, and uh, probably some of the systems that initially had this, they, they were APC for, in, based on fuzzy logic, but uh, but the thing is, we don't have a a, a use case uh, that says specifically that. Um, I, I am not aware of it, uh, Unati. Um, you, yeah, yeah, I think I it think would be. Uh, it, it would be hard to 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 say whether you know it was fuzzy logic or not, but we can definitely work uh, to understand uh, you know what are the specific concerns or questions around uh, uh, AI's potential to help understand uh, where AI can add you know value uh, versus fuzz, fuzzy logic. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Um, a question here from AJ Prasad. He asks. Um, what is the accuracy level of inferred data from soft sensors? Yeah, so uh, we measure soft sensors, um, you know, results uh, based on, you know, how much there is relative error between the measurement as well as um, the actual. Uh, it depends on on the case by case as well as how much data is available, right? Uh, from from the customer for us to train it. So obviously, if you ha if we have a lot more data, it's going to be more accurate. Uh, the relative error can be as low as five percent, or you know, if uh, if we have less frequent data, it can be as high as 10, 10 15 percent. So it depends on the volume of data, the quality of the data for us to achieve uh, the relative you know, accuracy. Yes, and, and something that I would say that is important is that the the important thing about um, the accuracy of prediction is for the purpose. What is the purpose that we have? Um, if we have a purpose of control, probably a 90, 95% accuracy will be more than enough. And also depends on the nature of the variable that, that we're predicting. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we have time for just a couple more questions. Um, so I have one here from uh, Suresh uh, Agrawal, who asks that, um, or he states rather, that um, he's heard of uh, the cement industry using data reconciliation techniques. Um, and he's wondering how that differs uh, between, or oh, well, rather, how your offering differs uh, from that and how. AI is different, basically. Yes, well, a, a, uh, my, you know, I, I have expertise in data reconciliation, and basically, data reconciliation is just basically getting data and map that versus, uh, let's say, first principle model, input outputs of mass, inputs out of F energy. But the thing is, is this presupposes many things, and it's just a, uh, a transformation of input versus reconcile, versus reconciled data. But still that's not going to help you to optimize anything, uh, I mean, in real time. So the, the AI problem uh, basically doesn't assume any form of, of, of equation. Uh, it's like the cooler. The cooler, uh, we have the opt optimizer, and we're never telling the cooler that all of the 
uh, flows in is going to equal to the amount of flow in secondary and tertiary and residual. It's just that AI just learns it. So in the case of AI, it's, uh, it becomes a little bit redundant. Uh, reconciliation now, that doesn't mean that we don't do that treatment, uh, pre-processing of data, elimination of outliers carefully, uh, and but th those are more techniques of data processing. So that, that would be my answer. Okay, excellent. And I have one final question here that I've seen quite a few people ask. Um, what are the sort of in-house technology requirements for this kind of system? Well, the, I would say this, that in-house, uh, you need to have a, a control system, right? Uh, you need to have a, uh, you might have a process data historian that's not required, but it's a, it's a good thing to have. And uh, and then your your control systems, uh, your regulatory control systems, just being tuned, okay, just normally okay. So, and since we are providing this, uh, you know, as an option through the cloud or mostly through the cloud, we are not asking too much of uh, computer power in your side. So it's really very little uh, that we request from the customer. Unati, you have something to add to? you know, from the systems perspective? Yeah, I think uh, you touched on most of them, Roberto. I think uh, what we need is obviously, um, you know, uh, access to your uh, streaming data. And we do have, um, you know, edge data collectors where we are able to uh, get your streaming data as well as historical, uh, either through historian or, 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 a, or a batch, um, uh, you know, load of the data. But really, as Roberto was saying is that, you know, we, we don't have uh, high requirements in terms of uh, getting you started. Okay, excellent. Thank you, guys. I think that uh, just about wraps it up for today. Um, thank you once again for the excellent presentation and very informative Q&A session. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone in the audience who took the time to attend today. Um, we know that with the pandemic that schedules have become a little complicated. So thank you for being here with us. We really do appreciate it. Um, any questions that we didn't get around to covering um, will be passed on to the team at Petuum and uh, they'll be able to get back to in due course. And uh, once again, everyone who registered to attend today will receive a full recording of the presentation uh, in the very near future. Um, and a final note, if you'd like to hear more uh, of these kind of first rate cement industry presentations, I would encourage you to stay tuned with World Cement because we'll be running our Envirotech 2020 event on the 14th of July. Uh, for more information, simply head over to worldcement.com forward slash uh, Envirotech 2020. Um, thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much.